Welcome to Nikki's Crochet Podcast. I am so excited for you to be here. We have a brand new guest, but let me remind you first to subscribe to my channel as well as the guest channel. Remember that this podcast is very special because you get to know the designers from a totally different perspective. So let's get ready. Hi, Kristen. I'm so excited for you to be here. You're one of my first guests. How are you doing? Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to get a chance to talk with you again. Thank you. Oh, I am so glad you have fantastic designs, like, like out of this world, like so intricate designs. Like, tell me, like, how did you actually get started to crochet? And are you just a crochet or are you a knitter too? Remind me. And how did you really get started on this whole process that your family teach you? Thank you, number one. I appreciate it, the compliment very much. I am very passionate about design. I have been a creative person as far back as I can remember. Uh, from drawing wedding dresses. Remember the Fashion 220 plates that we had as little girls? Yes, yes, I started, oh my gosh. I learned how to draw people from that. And so what I, I segued from that into just drawing uh, illustrations for fashion illustrations. And I used to draw, draw wedding dresses and evening gowns as a little girl, just with crayons or colored pencils or whatever. And in high school, I, uh, ventured into architecture, which was still another type of design and the CAD drawing and stuff. Um, but it wasn't until I got pregnant with my son and which was 20 years ago, he's tw or over 20 years ago now, he just turned 20 last month. And um, I was living overseas at the time and really just wasn't in a great marriage, had no support, no friends, no anything. And I was all alone pregnant. I did um, adopt a homeless dog who actually saved me in so many ways during that time. I loved him dearly. Um, but anyway, I had this overwhelming desire to learn how to knit and crochet to make baby booties and to make baby layettes while I was pregnant. And I was like, well, how are you going to do that? This was 20 years ago. There wasn't the internet. There wasn't no. patterns and video tutorials, none of that. And this was also during 9-11. So I was living in the Middle East around 9-11. First of all, we didn't get phone calls out. I don't think I even got to talk to my family post 9-11 for 10 days, something like that. And it was at a time when I was even just thinking, am I ever going to get on an airplane again? I'm too, I'm 8,000 miles from home. Can't swim that far. Like, how will I ever get home? And I was pregnant. And yeah. so having all those pregnancy hormones at the same time. And then I, when I finally got through to my mom, a knitter or a crochet, or I said, listen, I need you to go to Joanne Michaels, pick up a pamphlet, pick up a tool, and pick up a couple balls of yarn. Like, we didn't know what size needles or hooks to get. I gave her the most vague wish list and somehow I got a baby layette booklet in the mail. Six weeks later, it took six weeks for the mail to arrive back then. And uh, I got, got the book, got a couple, and I looked at the book and I went, oh yeah, I don't know how to knit or crochet. How am I gonna read this? And so I cried I, I, and I lived on the Mediterranean Sea. In Israel, it's on the Mediterranean Sea. So I walked down to the beach with my dog Rasta, my adopted homeless dog. And uh, I sat there and cried my eyes out, looked at this book and I was like, really, this is where it's gonna end? No, you've got, so I said, I'm just gonna keep looking at these symbols, not symbols, um, abbreviations, Yeah. right? This was before charts, yeah. <laughs> you know? Charts weren't prevalent in patterns back then. And I was like, you're just gonna have to keep reading this until it makes sense. Took a couple of days and it finally started making sense because I was reading cover to cover. So I was reading the abbreviation section in the back and the very little information about how to do the stitches. And I was like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> and again, so fragile, so scared, so yes. alone, yes. so emotional. And just, and so I decided to start with a booty, not a blanket. No, no, no. The <laughs> smallest thing seemed like the most, made the most sense, not knowing yeah. that it's the most complicated of everything in a layout, but whatever. <laughs> so I make this booty. I want to say it took five hours to make a newborn booty, which obviously yeah. is way, way too long. It's fine. Yeah. I finished. It was this big. And I was like, it's like, gigantic. I, like, I, 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 I wanted to cry, but then I said to myself, you know what? It's anatomically correct. It's the right shape. 
Yeah. It's the right everything. It's just too big. And so the math and scientists in my head said, well, just make it tighter or sm make smaller stitches and make it smaller. Again, not knowing that it was hook and yarn yes. and age and all that stuff, but it was very logical to me that, oh, well, we'll just make it smaller next time. And I did. And I was off running. Oh my God, that's awesome. I love it. Or just, you know, thinner yarn, you know, which obviously at that point you didn't know, but that's really cool. Right. I love that story. But you know, I have a problem solver in my head, like in my core, yes. in my spinal column, in my soul, I have a problem solver. It doesn't matter what's going on. Yes. My my first reaction to anything is, well, how can we fix this? <laughs> yes, exactly. For me too. When I look at something as the first thing, okay, I need to solve this something. I, I don't like uncertainty or unfinished things, even though I have many of them, which is probably why my brain is crazy. <laughs> I want them finished <laughs> somehow. <laughs> uh, but now you've, you told us the story, how did you get started? But how did you actually now then design or get you into the designing business? You came back to the U.S. first, I assume. Uh, how did you get into the designing business? Yes and no. So this is, this is actually really, really interesting, I think, anyway. So uh, I, my son was born in May in the Middle East. We needed zero of the things I made him. He didn't wear a hat. He didn't need a blanket in the sweater. So, I, and I thought, well, I got to move on to something else and I can't stop stitching. I didn't realize at the time that it was helping me with the anxiety and the fear of living in a very volatile part of the world at a very volatile time. Not only was it 9-11, but then it was the second Gulf War and we were living in quite a military environment, right? Yeah. And so I didn't realize that the stitching was really helping me cope with all of the things that were not going great in my life uh, and being a new mom and no support yes. and just wondering, am I a failure every day, right? If these are the normal things that you deal with. And I didn't realize that the stitching was helping me. I was like, well, I can't stop knitting and crocheting just because my baby doesn't need it. What else can I make? Yes. And I thought to myself, you know, I could make shawls and send them home to my mom and I don't know, maybe, maybe she could sell them. I, I, I don't know, because my brain always thinks about how we can sell things, too. Yes, you know? exactly. Especially at this time. I knew my marriage was not going to uh, not gonna survive. And yeah. so I, I wasn't ready to deal with plan B yet, mm -hmm. but I knew I needed to start those wheels turning. Problem solving. The beginning yes. of problem solving, right? And so um, I thought, well, how am I going to make a triangle? And how am I going to make a square? And I was like... I can apply what I know about algebra and geometry to make stuff with yarn. I, yes. I was like, <laughs> all my loves at the same time. And so Perfect. I grab a notebook and a pencil and a calculator. This was before we had phones with calculators. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, oh, I had so much fun figuring oh, out you. without knowing gauge, without knowing stitches per inch, but just kind of figuring it out, going, oh my gosh, if I'm getting this many stitches, I can do this size triangle with this and that and skip it. I didn't even know what a single crochet two together or a double crochet two together was. I skipped stitches if I wanted to decrease. Like <laughs> it was very organic because there was no it. supplementation. There was nothing, there were no tutorials. So, but you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And so I started sending them home to my mom she loved them, would wear them, and people would want to buy them off of her back. So it gave me this hope that um, I, my, I didn't want to come home and put my baby in daycare. Not that it's wrong for other people, but there was something in my heart and in my brain at that time that said, I can't do that. And I thought, let's, let's just make it as hard as possible then. Let's try to yes. figure out how to incorporate high labor into working for yourself and making a living and being a stay-at-home mom at the same time. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> and that's probably how you got to designing so many lace patterns because my gut feeling is that's how you evolved into it because you just said you, you skip stitches naturally or getting, which, by the way, I love. I mean, this is actually, my opinion, the best way to learn crochet is not to be Exploring. so fixated. As much as I love formulas, I absolutely am a formula person. I'm a math person. I'm a brain, science brain. So, but I do love the flexibility of what else can I do to make it look better, which is why I am try to invent. I don't know if I'm the first one, but I sure figure something out to make something look better, right? Even it's a totally different way of doing it, which is fine as long as you are happy with it. So I love that. But did you evolve you into doing- You can still be organic. You yes. can still do 
discover something on your own organically, even though it's been done before. I've said that many times. So exactly. People will like something that I taught them and they'll be like, oh my gosh, did you invent this? I said, well, or it doesn't matter <laughs> to me, but I, I don't know if anyone that's ever existed in the human history has ever yeah. done it before. Possibly. Possibly. A, very likely. And some some yeah. techniques are not really shared publicly. And then some uh, are shared so many times and you realize, oh, that one technique has four different names. It is what it is. Right. You know, you never right. know. But did you evolve doing matter. lace patterns because of that a natural organic way of learning how to do crochet? Or is that just because you just love the lace effect? <laughs> I take it a step further than that, actually. I I really see in texture. Oh, yeah. Like, I, it doesn't matter what I'm looking at. I could yeah. be looking at, uh, there's there's little rocks in yes. the, between the driveways outside my window. I can find a pattern in that. Um, the, 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 the structure of the leaves yeah. on a palm tree, mm -hmm. the structure of the clouds, the ripples of water, brickwork. It doesn't have to be organic. It can be yes. man-made. Too, but my eyes see in texture and oh, see pattern. So for me, uh, it was there was a point in time when it, I allowed myself to explore my love of nature and textures and apply it in stitch work, which has been super fun for me. I love that we have a similar braid in that case then because I get really inspired by just going outside in nature and, and looking around and finding things. And sometimes it doesn't even have to be nature. Like you said, it can be man-made. There are sometimes things where I just look at a specific house, the way the house is designed and then look at the colors and the texture. And I'm like, oh, we can make something like that in yarn, you know? Or what about like mosaic tiles or Moroccan yes. tiles? Like yes. you can definitely motifs in tiles and I've been inspired by tiles uh, for crochet motifs many many times yes. and motifs to be honest with you and especially with the way that they have a motif a main motif and then a mini motif yes. I've designed uh, fabrics out of bigger motifs and smaller ones because of that for sure oh, very I much I love yeah. that. I'm so glad. But let's hop into something that's very kind of like naturally kind of evolved right now because you mentioned looking out the window, but I don't think anyone knows you're actually sitting in your own RV, which is absolutely amazing. Let's talk <laughs> about that because wh wh where in the world are you putting all your yarn? I mean, uh, let's talk about the RV. Like, how did that even come about? I mean, I kind of know some of the backstory, but not everything. And feel free to share as much as you like. Right. Well, you know, sometimes the world's not the most stable place. And, you know, sometimes things are out of our control and sometimes yes. they're in our control. And I really, uh, it's not about what happens to us. True. It's how we react to it, right? Yes. And sometimes things can sound and be as devastating as you can even imagine. Yeah. And, and sometimes not. Uh, things could, but at the end of the day, things could always be worse too. And so to try True. to keep perspective between okay, this is really scary, but I got to figure out how to make a solution. And yeah. at the same time, come from a place of gratitude at some point through the chaos and yeah. say, hey, it could always be worse. I've been through worse. Yes. I got that. So five months ago, uh, well, you may be aware of, you know, costs changing yes. here in the U.S. And I'm sure that there are things that are un unstable all over the world. And we are, as human beings, more alike than we are different. We all have yes. problems, right? Very whether true. they're whether they're public, whether they're seen, or whether they're internal. However, yeah. five months ago, I, I've always been a renter, never owned my own home. And um, the home that I was living in was large enough to house the inventory for my business as well. So it was much bigger than we needed to live in, but it was cheap. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, not commercial, residential real estate was so much cheaper than yes. commercial real estate that it made sense for me to rent a house to house my business and work yeah. from home. Well, in the last year, prices have not only doubled in my area, yeah, they tripled. Wow. And so my landlord just continually kept raising my rent. First time it was $500 a month increase. Then towards the end or towards this was right after I had just signed a lease. Even I had signed the lease in November and come December and January. He's like, yeah, the house is worth triple what it was oh worth God. when I bought it. When you moved in three years ago, I'm selling it. You need to go. Oh my gosh. And so I'm sitting there going, okay, well, 
I guess I'm going to find another rental. Rent had increased by such a degree in my area that I couldn't even afford a one bedroom apartment for the price I was paying for this house that was housing all my inventory. You know, the longer you wait to make a decision when things are bad, sometimes the worse it can be. And I'll never forget, it was right around February 1st. Well, February 1st was the day I announced it. So it must have been the week prior. I just went, I got to get rid of everything. Yeah. I don't know where I'm going yet. I have to stay locally. My son's here and my mother's here and they both need me. And so I can't just go find somewhere. So I realized I had to let go of everything. And now I've always had a dream of traveling in an RV and and living a minimal lifestyle. I didn't really want to do it when uh, I was down, when when I was letting go of my revenue at the same time. You know what I mean? Uh, Now, I have to say, I've been in the craft industry for 18 years. Where I have focused has had to change drastically during any number of other crises, crises, yeah. right? Yeah. So like when the publishing industry crashed many years ago, I, I relied, my income and in being a single mother was dependent on book royalties. And I got a check yeah. twice a year and survived on two checks a year back then. And then when that I lost my income by 90% at that point and had to scramble and figure out, okay, what am I doing now? So this is not the first time that this industry has really changed. Yeah. Changed drastically for me and my business. Now I don't have a husband. I don't have a second income. I never received child support. So it made it that much more challenging in those times. Right? So, back to the current one. <laughs> I just want to say it's normal. This happens. Oh, big you know? time. You know, and, and whether, and I came up with, like I said, the no husband, the no this, there are people that have major disasters in their lives, regardless of how many incomes are in the house. So I realize exactly. it is more of a universal problem than just my specific problem. Yeah, but anyway, no, I, get that. Uh, I had to downsize 90% of my personal belongings. Wow. All of my professional belongings and had to do it all quickly. And at the same time, one of my precious kitties passed away unexpectedly. And he, he died February 8th, and I announced the end of the yarn business February 1st. So I mean, it was, it was very close. And he yeah. has a litter mate brother, Bjorn, who um, then had all sorts of other problems because of watching our house get dismantled while yeah. watching his litter mate brother uh, leave. And then my 20 year old son, moving out at the same time so i mean lose it was a lot of loss all at once you know um and trying to hold it all together and have hope that things are going to work out and you know hustle in the background and come up with other things and yes you know and i'm doing it but i mean still you have now this rv which is cool because you're not stationary anymore you can go wherever you want and you can really explore the world and get even more inspired and motivated but do you have a it's going to be a area? while. Well, it's going to be a while till I travel in the RV. Yeah. I'm still just really getting settled in my new yeah, life. Yeah, makes stuff. sense. I'm figuring out how to film in here and figuring yes. out how to store things. So yes, I do have a storage unit that's 10 by 15. That's a few miles away, and I have a little shed here in the driveway that I yeah. rent. Um, and so I kind of juggle back and forth between what I need. The storage unit is not personal belongings. Like there are a couple of bins of photo albums that I couldn't let go of, yeah. but I really let go of everything else personal, which has always been a dream of mine to know what minimal living felt like. I've always wanted to do this. I just thought it was going to come when I could retire and not have to work at the same time. You know what? Sometimes the universe has a different plan and it's okay, but you are taking it really well. I I feel like you're taking, you're a very strong, you're a very strong woman and you can do this. I mean, you've been through worse and I feel like this is amazing, but, uh, so how much yarn do you have on hand? been through worse. Yes. Yeah. So how much hand, uh, yarn do you have on hand all the time to just design? Do you get, obviously you get inspired now by the outside world versus like me. I sometimes just look at my yarn and get inspired by that, but you have to like really motiv- modify your designing. Did, did your designing change at all during this process of the way you start your designs? Um, no, not at all. I, I really don't think that that part of, 
how does, as much as shocking as it was to have all of these life changes, I'm, I'm settled. I'm here and everything's back to normal. <laughs> I love it though. That's awesome. I know. I know I'm very, very adaptable. I like, love that. If it wasn't for my kitty Bjorn, I could sleep in a car if I had to. Like I, I can do what it takes to get where I need to go. Like, and I know I that, that sounds extreme, but if it's a goal, if there's all, if there's a sacrifice to get to a goal, yeah, and I can say, hey, oh, it's not so bad. I've been through worse. It's all right. We're, we're gonna get there. I can really get focused on the goal. Like, Love I it. really am passionate about doing whatever it takes to reach your goals. All right, within reason. I mean, nothing crazy. <laughs> I love that though. Do you have a funny story though? Um, when it comes to yarn, maybe your cats or your children or even, or your child, I'm sorry. Um, or just generally a funny story that you've done. I, I've had a few designers that have a completely story just for themselves. And we're like, oh my gosh, I did some complete mess here. But I'd love to know, I, and I like to ask that all the designers, uh, do you have a funny story? Everyone has some kind of funny story when it comes to yarn. I probably have a hundred, <laughs> you know, from doing a live stream podcast daily for years. I mean, you would be amazed at what just comes up when you're live in front of an audience. I've done yes. over a thousand episodes. Like I have a bunch of stories from that, but I did want to go back and tell you the funny story of how I became a designer from Ooh. selling record wear. That's okay. actually, I think that that's kind of funny because once I got to the U.S. after my mom selling some of my shawls and I had this hope that I could sell my ready wear stuff when I got here had not thought it through we I literally left my ex-husband with my baby who was 22 months old with the clothes on our back one suitcase a couple of toys for him a couple of changes of clothes for both of us with my crochet hooks and knitting needles with the hope that I could figure out a way to make a living when we got here, like, and went on a plane 8,000 miles with just that. So then, you know, fast forward a couple of months, crocheting and knitting up a storm because I was so stressed out and this is what kept me sane, right? Yeah. And I would, I would pretend to be stay at home mom all day long. And then when he was sleeping, I don't need to sleep. Now is when I start making things, <laughs> right? And so once I stockpiled, like, a couple dozen shawls I went to the nicest boutique in town and said hey do you want to buy them and they're like yes so they bought them sold all of them in six weeks he goes yeah I want to place a reorder can we have them in four weeks and I went Ooh, it took it took a long time to make all those there's no way I can keep up with wholesale and yeah. labor costs like I I made my money back in the yarn and then some I was buying retail yarn at the time I had yeah. no idea about wholesale I mean you don't know you don't know and the yeah, internet exactly. wasn't there to help you you know and so it was shortly after that that i said you know i gotta figure out a way to still do this because i can't live without knitting and crocheting and i had already had it in my head that i was going to support us with yarn i, oh, I, I love believed that. that was going to happen i there was no nothing else <laughs> and so I, I this was the time when jessica simpson was very popular and on a tv show a reality show and yeah. she uh, and they showed this really beautiful delta stitch crochet shawl that she wore on stage Ooh. at one of her at one of her uh concerts and i fell in love with the stitch and when i went to go look and see what the, it was i discovered jennifer hansen from stitch diva was selling <laughs> patterns on ebay to oh make my gosh this shawl and i was like i can write what i'm doing i can write patterns I can tell people how to, I can teach people how to do what I'm doing. I will. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just going to write patterns then. So I, so I thought, well, what I, what should I do? I should, should I focus on knitting? Should I focus on crochet? I don't know. Should I go to magazines? Should I go to yarn companies? Who's going to buy my design? So I thought, I'm going to try everything. It's like throwing the spaghetti at the wall to see what's going to stick. Right. Yeah. So I, 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 I sent a proposal to a magazine for or for a yarn company for the crochet and a magazine for the knit and i thought okay and we'll see who comes back first <laughs> i got a yes from both on the same day two weeks later and That's i was awesome. like okay then we're gonna focus on both and i have for 18 years i love that <laughs> that is amazing that is so cool 
I know you talked about that you your world's all about yarn, but do you have any hobbies outside of yarn? I mean, some people like gardening, some people like reading books or cooking or baking. Do you have any hobbies outside of yarn? I am somebody that is passionately curious about everything. Like I have an unsatiable, insatiable, insatiable desire to learn at all times. Like any time I can be learning something new. I am. I love to learn languages. I love to, uh, I, I love to cook. I love to draw. I love to play guitar and piano. I love, I love making furniture with wood. I love woodworking. I love it. I love it. I love everything. Like oh, I'm just I one of those that. people that's enthusiastic about <laughs> everything. And if I meet someone that knows something that I don't know, that's all I want to know. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're such a curious person. I love that. I mean, that sounds like the perfect friend. No matter what, you're going to be excited about that person. <laughs> so I love it. I'm always enthusiastic. Always. Like everything makes me excited. I don't know why. It's just who I am. But I'm always enthusiastic about whatever's new, whatever's coming. And okay. And, and I'm just that. so easygoing. I can get, I'm up for anything, anytime. <laughs> well, that's perfect. Being optimistic. But I have to say, let's jump right into it because you do, considering you do a lot of new things, have a new book because you have many, many books, like so many books. But let's talk about your brand new book. Tell me about it or tell everyone about it because it's amazing just to cover itself. And I know we're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but just to cover itself <laughs> is amazing. So tell us about it. Well, now that you mentioned the cover, I'm so excited that I taught myself how to make metallic letters for this. This I'm jealous. Like, oh, <laughs> it's so it's something I learned how to do in Photoshop. And once I learned, I'm like, it's going on the cover of a book one day. I don't know which one. And I learned it prior to a couple books ago. Like, and I was like, I don't know which book it's going on, but some book is going to have a title in all metallic letters Perfect. one day. This and is the perfect so when one. Punching Power came out, I'm like, oh, yes, this is the one. <laughs> I love it. So tell us about what's the book all about? It says Crochet Power. So is it to learn stitches or what is it about? Tell us about it. Well, it's funny that what you picked up on from when I taught myself to knit and crochet really ties into this book. And when you perfect. said it, I was like, whoa, so I've been thinking about this all along. And it's funny, <laughs> even in the introduction, I say in there, I wrote this book for me for yeah. the beginner crocheter in me. So it's really full circle to hear Love us it. talk about Perfect. the beginning today. That was cool. <laughs> so what's special about this book is that it is not just a stitch dictionary. And it's a way for you to empower your creative spirit to oh. explore on your own without stitch patterns. And it's not to say, do this instead of stitch patterns. Yes. I feel like there's a time and a place for everything. There's yes. everything has its place and its time everything Perfect. and so what's special about this book is that i take each stitch pattern that's in the book and i show it worked even in rows right just back yep. and forth in rows and then i show how it's adapted to work even in the round which can be very different in some stitch yes. patterns mm -hmm. i show how to do a top down increasing so that you could do a top down increasing shawl or um a, a triangle or a half hexagon, meaning I show you how to do a single increase at the sides and double increase in the center, Love flat it. in rows. And then I show you how to do it increase in the round so that you're starting in the center. Are we doing four repeats for a square? Are we doing six for a hexagon or an octagon, right? That sort of thing. So you get all of that for each stitch pattern with charts, with written instructions. Oh, I love and one of, the things, one of the things that I've learned over the years from writing for traditional publishing and then going to book signings and getting to meet customers as they uh, tell me about what they like about my books or what they don't like. And one of the things that I learned in, in um, mainstream publishing working with publishers was that all of the people not all a lot would complain about how small the font was in their book yeah. and how hard it was to read because of the fancy layouts with the dark uh blo bo blocks or yes. boxes behind the text yes. looks great but if you're actually trying to teach yourself something in a book it's no longer beauty over function it really should be function over beauty yes. so when i went to independent publishing i this is my 10th book that i've independently published where i am the publisher and the author love it and in all of those books 14 point font 
Nice. I have that too for my eBooks. I put them all big. The yeah. only thing I made a little smaller is the material list because I felt like that mm -hmm. is not as important while you go through it. You just need it once. Right. And then everything else is 14. So I agree. It needs to be bigger. And I did that for all yeah. my eBooks as well. I don't even, bigger is better. <laughs> yeah. It's about teaching. And it's, and yeah. it, especially when someone's trying to learn something new, reducing the amount of variables is a great way to set yourself up for success. If you have to struggle with the reading of it and struggle with the concept of it and struggle with hand -eye coordination, that's too much at one time. I, I think I think that if you're really trying to help people to learn, yes. you need to make it as easy as possible. And it doesn't mean everything has to be easy, yes. but reduce the number of variables that they have to work at. Exactly, 100%, I agree. Kristen, it was so, so nice to talk to you. Thank you so much. If anyone wants to grab the book, I have all the links down below in the description. I have one main summary link that has everything linked to Kristen, the book, her website, everything. So go take a look. Be sure to subscribe to both of our channels. Turn on the bell to get notification next time we publish new videos. And of course, share this video. I'm sure anyone else wants to listen to this too. We're having fun here. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Kristen. I hope you guys have a beautiful day. Bye and see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you.